alumnus from the university. I did civil engineering. I followed on with a PhD in biofuel production and looking at sustainability of biofuel production. Uh, I did a project during my PhD in Chile looking at the cultivation of seaweed in the south of Chile uh, and conversion to bioenergy. So that's how I developed the context there. After my PhD at uh, the Universidad del Desarrollo, uh, the one on the left hand side there, uh, invited me come, to come back for uh, a postdoc. And also I work a lot with the University of Concepcion. Uh, so Concepcion is the second biggest city uh, in Chile and also a very good university uh, there. So... How you? This wasn't too long ago. Uh, this is where I made my mistake. I was having some beers with Robin and I told him that I was coming back on a holiday. Uh, so this is something that happens fairly often these days in Chile actually uh, because we have the office out there uh, we've got quite a few researchers coming out fairly regularly uh, this is for a conference with uh, the Catholic University uh, in Santiago I'm very much involved uh, as Robin was saying with the alumni group out there uh, with many of the engineers uh, so uh, part of the talk that I wanted to give today was to encourage uh, more development uh, in Chile between this university and universities in Chile. Uh, now, I'm an environmental engineer, um, and I knew that I was going to be talking to guys in energy systems. It's not particularly my area. So the, the talk that I was going to give was going to be very broad, uh, so to be applicable to as many people as possible, and to be honest, fairly light uh, for a Friday afternoon. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about my research and my area of research is more around water management uh, in the area of copper mining in Chile. But I also want to look or talk a little bit about energy challenges uh, that the copper mining industry is facing at the moment. Uh, first of all, well, we have one Chilean here. Have we got any other Chileans? Ah, another Chilean. <laughs> and who's been to Chile? Okay, excellent. So actually, Quite a high proportion of this group have some connection with Chile uh, already. Um, something I do find is that people who don't have that connection often don't know terribly much about Chile. So I just wanted to start off uh, by explaining a little bit about the country. Uh, so as Robin said, it has an enormous coastline uh, of 4,300 kilometers. The widest point is 350 kilometers, a population of 7.6 million. A GDP, which is the highest in Latin America, uh, $15,700 uh, per capita, and most importantly, the national drink, and it has to be said, Robin's favourite when he's over there, is Pisco Sours. Uh, so there's quite a bit of diversity in the country in the south. Uh, it stretches almost down to the Antarctic. Uh, it becomes a little bit more temperate uh, as you move uh, to the north. Uh, so this area of Chile uh, was actually was very important in the 1700s and 1800s before the Panama Canal uh, was built uh, for trading uh, between Europe and South America. And obviously Darwin was one of the most important uh, characters uh, to go to that area at that point. Uh, the central zone where Santiago is, Santiago is a population of 7 million, it's where I live, it's where my university is. Uh, it becomes a more Mediterranean climate and as Robin knows extremely well, also it's excellent grape growing uh, area for good wines. And the north, this is the, the copper mining uh, area. So it's much more arid, it's a desert climate, but also a fair amount of agriculture uh, as well. So the economy tends to tell a fairly interesting story uh, of a country Around the end of the, the 1980s, this was the end of the, the military dictatorship which they had in Chile. Uh, so on the right hand side there is the growth rate of the country. Uh, so after the dictatorship for the next almost 10 years or so, uh, they had excellent growth uh, sitting around between 5 and 10 percent. It dipped a bit uh, during the, the Asian economic crisis, uh, then recovered and fell down again uh, during the global economic crisis. And now it was fairly steady up until uh, a few years ago, where, as uh, Robin mentioned, 
Uh, the issue with the, the Chinese market uh, has receded a little bit and copper prices have really hit a bit of a rock bottom at the moment, so it's, it's greatly affecting the industry uh, just now. How important is mining to Chile? Fairly important. Uh, the, it's worth around 15% uh, of the country's GDP, and that's actually reduced fairly recently. It directly employs around 3% uh, of the population. Obviously, a lot of people work for indirect services to the mining industry, and it's worth about a total of $50 billion to the country every year in exports. As I mentioned earlier, most of the mining uh, tends to occur in the, more, in the north, so the, the map on the right hand side there is the, the largest copper mines and gold mines uh, in Chile, uh, so in the very arid parts uh, of the country. Mining has uh, come up in international media um, with increased frequency, I would say, recently, and often due to the environmental issues uh, that Chile faces with regards uh, to mining. So just a few that I picked up on here. Much of it is down to water, so the headline there is mining and logging companies leaving all of Chile without water. Okay, that's perhaps a little bit of an extremist take on it. Uh, there is a bit of issue between agriculture, so vines or mines, agriculture and mining in the north of Chile. Uh, and you can see in the top right hand there, uh, Chile's mining sector is expected to double its energy demand uh, by 2025. So these are a few uh, environmental issues that have been picked up uh, by the mainstream media. An interesting case recently is the Pasco Lama gold mine, uh, fairly near Santiago, actually. So this is a huge development by Barrett Gold, uh, and they pumped an incredible investment uh, into this project. Uh, and uh, an environmental assessment was done uh, on the mine, and it showed that it was going to have considerable impact upon the, the water resource uh, for the central zone, and particularly Santiago. Now, it's interesting because this is one of the first cases where actually people got upset uh, about a mining operation in Chile and tried to do something about it, and actually the government went ahead uh, and they haven't closed completely the project, uh, but it's certainly been put on hold for a long time. And this is after a huge investment of several billion dollars. Uh, so this could be a turning point in mining in Chile. With regards to, to water use, um, in Chile in general, there's very high water availability. Uh, that's mainly, however, concentrated in the southern part of the country. Uh, that is a fairly temperate climate, huge amount of rainfall. But in the north, uh, so the green uh, colour here is the bar showing availability of water uh, in cubic metres per second. The purple uh, bar rather whirling in the north there is the demand of water. So demand outstrips uh, supply considerably. Some early work that I did when I went to Chile was to look at the water scarcity index uh, of the different regions. Um, and as there's lots of different data that it was possible to use for that and I was looking, is, is a fairly simple calculation just of uh, availability over demand, um, but there's various different uh, sets of data for the mining industry, for example, so I use different types of data. The worst uh, water scarcity index uh, that I found for the, the mining regions was around uh, 25, uh, so that's 25 times more water is being used uh, than there is availability for. Now how does that work? Um, in the north, there's a lot of fossil aquifers. Uh, so these are aquifers that have been built up over tens of thousands of years uh, from very low rainfall. Uh, obviously, that's been extracted at a far greater rate than it's being recharged. And mining companies are now falling foul of this. One, because the, the extraction of the water uh, that they're taking is having a huge impact upon local environments and the fauna there. And two, they're running out of water. Uh, and they need water to operate. Uh, as part of that study, uh, I was also looking at the impact of various different sectors uh, with the data uh, that I had. The blue part of the bar is the mining industry, uh, so that's very much dominant in the second region of Antofagasta. Uh, the yellow part uh, is agriculture, which makes up the vast majority of water use throughout Chile in general, apart from 
uh, the second region of Anacogasta, where around 65% uh, of water consumption is from the mining industry. Who has worked in mining previously, or who has a reasonable idea of how mining works? So I've got a few people. I've got a few people, actually. That's, that's quite impressive. That's slightly worrying for me also. It's quite probable that you know considerably more than I do about mining. <laughs> uh, so basically, this is a very rough guide to mining. This is sulfide, copper sulfide mining. Uh, you have a whacking great pit, uh, or it can be underground. In Chile, generally, they're open pits uh, where the ore is extracted. Uh, it's crushed uh, to reduce the size. Uh, stockpiled and then goes through ball mills uh, to reduce the size even more. Uh, the copper is extracted in the flotation part, so reagents are added uh, that makes the copper particles hydrophobic. Uh, the, the water is aerated, the copper attaches itself to the bubble and it can be skimmed off the top. The waste from that process, which is called the tailings, uh, goes to the tailing storage, which tends to be an enormous dam. Uh, and then once the, the copper has been skimmed off, it can be uh, refined uh, and concentrated. Okay, so that's a very rough idea of how mining works. Where is water used? Uh, there hasn't been a huge amount of research done uh, on looking at water balances of mines. It's never been a particularly important area, but it's really coming to light these days. Uh, one study uh, that was completed recently, or relatively recently, um, by the University of British Columbia, they looked at the th a theoretical water balance of uh, a typical mining operation, uh, so copper sulfide mining, uh, and they found this is for a, a mine with a throughput of 50,000 uh, tons of copper ore uh, per day, so this is the, the rock basically, um, so a medium sized mine. Uh, they calculated that the water loss would be around uh, almost 39,000 cubic meters per day. So about almost a, a cubic meter of water for a cubic meter of rock ore uh, going through the mine. The vast majority of this following the, uh, the processing of the copper goes to tailings. Uh, so that's water that's entrained in the tailings. Uh, it's then lost through evaporation, seepage, uh, or just entrained. Uh, within the tailings, and a lot is also used in the road network, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, in Chile, the losses are fairly similar to what that study found, uh, actually. Um, I mean, both were focused on, or sorry, the previous study was focused on sulfide ore, so the majority is lost in concentration, and a little bit, uh, around 10%, on the actual mine site, uh, and that's mainly through dust suppression. So what's interesting is to look at how we can save that water. Uh, so again, from, from the same study, uh, they found that road dust suppressants, uh, so this is chemicals uh, applied to roads uh, that binds the topsoil uh, of the roads. This is important, I need to say, because uh, being in a very arid environment and with enormous uh, trucks, uh, using these roads, they kick up a huge amount of dust. It causes health problems uh, for the workers on the site, obviously uh, respiratory illnesses. Uh, it also causes problems with visibility and they have more accidents when there's more dust. So it's very important the mines actually uh, keep the amount of dust in the air to a minimum. So one option instead of using water uh, for suppressing the dust is chemical dust suppressants. Another is ore pre-sorting. Uh, so before the ore gets processed, they can take out uh, the part of the ore that has the, the maximum concentration of copper uh, in it. Uh, so that's generally done through uh, spectrophotometry or x-rays. Um, and another option is thickening of the tailings. So as I said previous, previously, the vast majority of the water in mining goes to the tailings uh, and that can be thickened. From this study, they suggested that the best case scenario, they could reduce uh, water consumption by 71%. Uh, it's pretty high. Uh, but that comes at a cost, and that's something I looked at also in my research. Uh, so for road dust suppression, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a bit of dust being kicked up uh, there by these enormous trucks. On the right-hand side uh, is a water tank. And when you go to a mine, uh, you often see the water tanks going past maybe once every hour, once every two hours. Uh, to spray water in the road to keep the dust down. 
Uh, the, the dust suppressants that can be introduced can be polymers, hydrocarbons, vegetable resins, or salts. Uh, a study that I did with a colleague recently was looking at the use of magnesium chloride uh, for dust suppression in Chile. So magnesium chloride is a salt, obviously, uh, that's a byproduct of lithium uh, production in the north. Uh, so that also takes place uh, in the Chilean desert. So it's an extremely cheap byproduct to use, and it can be mixed with uh, fresh water to produce a brine uh, that can be sprayed on roads. The idea is that it binds uh, the, the topsoil, and it's also hygroscopic, uh, so it's able to absorb uh, moisture from the air at night. So we were working with a company that was producing this stuff and with several mines that wanted to introduce it uh, into their operations. So what we wanted to do was check out how much water they're using uh, per square meter of road uh, per day, normally just with fresh water, and how much that could be reduced by with the use of magnesium chloride. Uh, this is one of the mines uh, they were looking at. Uh, we'd attached flow meters uh, to the water trucks that they were using. Uh, in each different part of the mine. Uh, so the Bisha Fita here is magnesium chloride and uh, the blue uh, tracks are where normal water was used. Uh, so for the primary roads, they were treating 37% of the roads with magnesium chloride, the rest with water. And the secondary roads, the majority was treated with 87% uh, magnesium chloride in this particular case study. Uh, we found that they were using around uh, 1.3 litres per metre squared per day uh, of fresh water normally in the whole mine. And when they introduced magnesium chloride as a dust suppressant, they were able to take down the water consumption to 0.04 uh, litres uh, per metre squared per day, so a considerable reduction. I also did some cost-benefit analysis of alternative suppressants in the market, uh, and this was based on the, the model that they made in British Columbia. So I was in contact with those guys and was able to uh, reproduce the model and adapt it uh, with some different strategies for uh, water consumption reduction. Uh, so this was the original water consumption at the top for, uh, uh, for, for dust suppression of the roads. And these were using different types of products that I was looking at. Uh, and I calculate obviously the, the cost water saving ratio, so this is the cost uh, for the amount of uh, water saved. Another method, as I mentioned, for, for saving water in copper mines is through dewatering of the tailings. Does anyone recognize uh, the photograph on the right hand side? It was Brazil uh, last year. Yeah. So it was the, the San Marco disaster, this is a, a BHP bulletin uh, iron ore site. Uh, and this happened in November last year. Uh, and actually, I was talking uh, with a guy from BHP bulletin several weeks uh, before this took place. And he was telling me how secure the dams were with BHP bulletin. And this happened several weeks later. <laughs> So this was uh, a tailings dam, uh, so basically the waste uh, part of the, the iron ore operation that they had there. It stores water uh, and it stores excess rock. Uh, it failed uh, under uh, high rainfall uh, conditions, so the dam burst and all of the tailings went downstream. That particular incident caused the deaths of 19 people uh, in the village downstream and it's expected to cost BHP billeting around $10 billion. Uh, so a serious failure on their part. Um, so tailings, uh, they're a huge risk um, in the mining industry. They're a risk from heavy rainfall, flooding, aging dams. Uh, mines often operate throughout their lifetime. They leave a great whacking tailings dam somewhere and then they go. It's not their responsibility anymore. Uh, and there's, there's hundreds, possibly thousands, uh, certainly in the United States, in Chile, uh, there's many, and we're talking huge dams, we're talking dams of at least 100 meters uh, in some cases. There's a risk related to earthquakes, uh, which is particularly important in Chile, uh, and also to landslides. 
One of the options to deal with that risk and also to save water is through dewatering uh, of the tailings. In conventional mining operations, uh, tailings tend to be dewatered to around 35% uh, solids content. So still the vast majority is water. And that's through basic sedimentation, the sort of thing you would find in wastewater treatment plants, for example. Now, uh, solid contents around 80% are possible uh, in the industry, but this is through uh, very energy intensive uh, processes. Uh, to reach 80% solids, it's necessary to implement uh, filtration, uh, so pressure filtration, centrifugation, uh, these sort of technologies. It's becoming a little bit more prominent uh, in the industry, but due to costs, uh, it remains uh, fairly, its use remains fairly low. Again, something that I wanted to do was compare uh, various different methods uh, and look at the, the cost benefit uh, of various different technologies that the mining industry could use. Uh, so using data uh, from suppliers, uh, some of these technologies, I looked at the cost, I looked at uh, what sort of solids concentrate uh, they could get the, the tailings to. Um, and I looked at the water savings potential again for the same model, the uh, water footprint model that I was using previously. Uh, so it gives you a sort of idea of the water savings um, for a mine that would be using around 38,000 cubic meters per day, savings of around uh, eight to 9,000 cubic meters uh, would be possible, so around a third of the total water consumption. I uh, calculated the net present value for each of the different technologies and then also wanted to compare those to the, the dust suppression technologies. So basically to see what sort of focus a mine should have on in terms of cost and the amount of water that they can save. Uh, so what should, what should be their investment focus. And actually the cost of uh, dust suppression or dust suppressants, uh, they're much cheaper for the amount of water uh, that a mining operation can save. Uh, so that was a fairly interesting study. So that's all very good and nice. It's, it's, it's nice to make uh, operations efficient, it's nice to use less water, but still uh, water consumption in the mining industry, this is for Chile, is expected to continue, uh, is expected to increase. So uh, the total consumption at the moment in 2015-2016 is around 15 cubic meters per second. This is in the whole of Chile for the copper mining industry. And by 2025, that's expected to increase to around 25 cubic meters per second, so quite a considerable increase. That's mainly due to new developments and also due to reduced ore, uh, so the, the concentrate of copper uh, within the ore that they're processing. So traditionally, copper ore would make up around, the copper concentrate would be around one to two percent uh, in the rock. That's now heading down to 0.5 uh, to 1% in Chile. So effectively they require double the resources uh, to produce the same amount of copper. Uh, hence why they'll need considerably more water uh, than they've been using previously. So the way the mining industry uh, is going, they're now turning to the use of seawater uh, in the industry. An interesting case study is the Escondida project. So Escondida mine is a BHP bulletin run mine. Uh, is the biggest copper mine in the world. They have a $3.4 billion project to source all of the water for that mine uh, from the coastline. Uh, so they're looking to, to use around 2.5 uh, cubic meters per second of seawater in their operation. Uh, so it's a hell of a lot of water to take from the coastline up to the mountains. Um, so they've built a 500 megawatt gas fired power station. Uh, to achieve that. They were originally going to use coal uh, and that was their plan um, but with a lot of local pressure they decided to move away from that. So the disadvantages of seawater use, uh, it can be used, uh, raw, so raw seawater can be used for, for copper processing uh, but it has slightly lower copper recovery. Um, that's mainly, it's not due to the salinity of the seawater, it's mainly due to the presence of magnesium uh, ions. That can be taken out at high pH, so the use of lime, but that inhibits uh, the flotation of molybdenite. 
Uh, and this is an important byproduct uh, for recovering added value in the copper mining industry. Uh, also in Chile, mining operations tend to be sited fairly far uh, from the coastline. They tend to be around 200, 300 kilometers uh, from the coastline and extremely high altitude. So we're talking 3, 2,500 to 3,500 meters uh, in general. So that requires a lot of energy. A project that I'm now working on with the University of Concepcion is looking at the costs and energy usage of uh, using seawater in the mining industry in Chile. Um, so this was some work related to CAPEX and OPEX uh, of treatment and conveyance uh, of seawater to mines at different elevation levels. So you can see the total cost of using seawater, and this is for uh, desalinized seawater, is around two and a half uh, US dollars per cubic meter at zero elevation, so at sea level, but that rises to above six dollars uh, per cubic meter at around 4,000 uh, meters above seawater. And that's possible in Chile to have mines at 4,000 meters. Uh, so that's obviously prohibitive, uh, given especially the uh, the cost of copper at the moment. Um, a few options obviously are to use uh, raw sea water, uh, so it's in, in its present state, but obviously as I say, it reduces the, the copper recovery. Uh, using lime uh, precipitation uh, to take out the magnesium, or of course uh, reverse osmosis, uh, which is fine to use. Um, so again, just a few graphs to show uh, the different costs of desalinized water at various altitudes. Uh, and this was work about uh, investment. Uh, so this is the, the total cost of investment for a desalination plant for uh, a mine that would be using 100,000 cubic meters of water per day and 160 kilometers from the desal plant on the coastline uh, with the elevation uh, on the x-axis there. Uh, so that, again, that's for the three different scenarios of using raw seawater, uh, seawater precipitated with lime, and reverse osmosis in the blue there. So obviously, depending upon where the mine is, it's very important to whether the mining company would look at investing uh, in the use of seawater or not. How does it compare with different countries? Actually, Chile is the most expensive country uh, to introduce desalination, and that's mainly due to the cost of conveyance, which you can see is the blue bar there. Uh, one is because uh, the mines are far from the coastline, is due to the elevation of the mines, and it's also due to the very high electricity cost in Chile, uh, which of all the, the copper producing countries is the second highest after the Democratic Republic of Congo. So it's very hard to compete uh, with the other countries to compete, uh, to, to, to keep the the costs of operation low. So as a result of that, electricity is expected, electricity use is expected to uh, increase. Uh, so this is from 2015-16 until 2026. So this is terawatt hours on the y-axis there. Uh, so the, the filled line is expected consumption and the top and the bottom lines are maximum and minimum uh, respectively. Uh, and this is just a chart showing uh, expected increases in electricity use by region. Uh, so the, the region with the most amount of mining uh, is the purple one there, which is the region of Antofagasta. Uh, so this is partly due to uh, the increased use of desalinization, uh, which is the pink part of the, the pie chart there. So this is 2015-2026. Uh, also a bit increased use in concentration uh, and more use in uh, uh, the exhibition of copper oxide ores. So if we consider electricity generation in its current state in Chile, uh, as Robin said, uh, there's four different grids. They're not connected uh, to each other. Um, the bottom grids, they're not producing a huge amount of electricity relative to the other two. Uh, they're mainly from uh, hydro, uh, so obviously a huge amount of rainfall in the south. Uh, the central system, uh, which produces the most amount of electricity in Chile, 
is 50% thermal, 42% hydro, and it says 7% others. And in the north, it's predominantly uh, fossil fuel based. So coal, natural gas, uh, and a bit of oil. Um, I think at the moment, uh, the electricity companies are in the process of connecting the central and the northern grids, uh, which will help take a bit of pressure uh, off the northern grid. Um, but still, the, the electricity cost uh, is extremely high. One area that we're looking to do a little bit more research on is going to be the impact of droughts on electricity generation, the cost of electri electricity generation in Chile, uh, which is expected to increase. In terms of uh, non-conventional renewables, uh, they make up around 9%, uh, the majority of that being biomass at 3% of total electricity generation. Bizarrely, uh, in, in a country uh, with a huge amount of solar resource uh, solar PV only makes up 1.67% uh, of total electricity generation. There are a few developments in the north at the moment. Uh, so there's a few solar projects. Uh, these are three that are concentrated solar. Uh, one that is currently in development at the moment is uh, the Atacama One, uh, which is being built by Avangoa, the Spanish company. Uh, so that's reduced or have a capacity of 110 uh, megawatts with a 236 meter tower. Uh, actually, I think due to rising costs of that project, it's currently been put on hold. Um, so they're not entirely sure if it's economically viable or not. Uh, the other two aren't in development at the moment, uh, but those are planned for the next few years. So just a few concluding thoughts uh, from that. So definitely in the mining industry, uh, in general, in particular in Chile, uh, resource use efficiency, so the use of water, the use of energy, uh, is an absolute must at the moment, specifically due to uh, the cost of copper uh, just now. The environmental risks are extremely large, uh, and if things go wrong, that's going to be extremely costly uh, for the mining industry. And good long-term and well-thought-out energy and water management plans are a real necessity for the industry. And actually, talking to some guys in the industry, that's not currently the case, uh, which is quite worrying for such a large industry. The next stages of my research, um, working with the University of Queensland, uh, we're looking to, uh, to come up with a model uh, to optimize the use of water and energy in the copper mining industry. Uh, further environmental and economic analysis of different energy options. I'm not doing it that at the moment, but that would be extremely interesting. And that might be something uh, that could be applicable uh, to some guys working at Edinburgh University, which would be nice. Uh, with Concepcion, uh, we're starting a project on dry mining practices. Uh, and uh, my project, uh, which is predominantly on identifying and analysing environmental risks uh, for mining operations. So, thank you for coming along. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, let's not leave it there. Um, as Robin was saying, Edinburgh University has a pretty strong presence in Chile uh, these days. I'm very open to working with new people. I have uh, a very strong fondness uh, for the university here and for the people working here. I would love to work more uh, with people at the university, whether it's with exchange of students, whether it's uh, research proposals, looking for grants, uh, whether you're looking for industrial partners. Uh, I've got many contacts in the mining industry in Chile if anyone wants to develop that area of research. I would be absolutely delighted if you contacted me about anything uh, on that area. If you have any other questions, I'd be delighted to answer that also. Uh, but as I say, I prefer not to leave it there. Okay? Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.